Okay, good morning everyone. I hope that you are all comfortable and ready for an exciting day. Welcome to the 11th annual IRDR conference on why warnings matter and the launch of the UCL Warning uh, Research Centre. I am Dr. Karina Fernley. I'm Director of the UCL Warning Research Centre and Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Science and Technology Studies and will be your host today. I'm of course part of a broader team bringing you today's event and we hope you will find the day thoroughly interesting because we really do have a superb line up uh, to showcase uh, the best of research and work that's happening across the IRDR. The conference theme for 2021 is focused around warnings and this is driven in part by the recognition that 2020 may have looked a little bit different, perhaps through hindsight, but certainly uh, it would have looked different if we'd have had better COVID-19 warnings. So today we're going to explore why warnings matter, uh, starting with myself providing an overview of the state of the art of warnings and the rationale behind the new warning centre and what the aims of the centre are. Our keynote will be presented by Mami Mizutori, the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and Head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk, Re Disaster Risk Reduction. We have two panel sessions looking at warnings for exceptional versus expected events and at warnings for organisations. And our in conversation this year will be looking at warning and alert systems for health emergencies with key insights from the World Health Organisation and Go On, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. And we will also finish with a showcase of the UCL IRDR PhD and MRES research students work. We are again virtual this year and whilst it is sad we cannot meet in person and share those conversations during the breaks, we have arranged numerous networking events during the tea and lunch breaks in attempt to recreate those spaces that we will miss. We've had to update those links so please look out in the chats where we will be providing the new links for those meetings um, at the appropriate time so there'll be three of those events today. However, being virtual means that we can welcome guests from all over the world, making it a truly international event and providing insights and guests and attendees that wouldn't normally be able to attend. And we have tried to make full advantage of this whilst those COVID-19 restrictions remain. Given we are not in person, I cannot provide the usual fire exit warnings, which I would have really enjoyed. We have alerted you to the standard of tea or coffee that you'll be drinking today, but there are a few house housekeeping rules that I just wanted to highlight. Please do use the chat to introduce yourself, share links, resources, or make comments on what's going on. This is a space for all of you to chat and collaborate. If you have any questions for the panel members, please make sure they are posted in the Q&A button that you have on your Zoom webinar. So please use the Q&A for questions that you might want to ask. We've asked panelists to make sure their microphones are muted when not speaking and the cameras are turned off when not speaking, but we may have the occasional blip, but hopefully there won't be any issues. And if there are any security issues, we will hopefully deal with those uh, very quickly or please do bring them to our attention. If you are uh, sharing your thoughts on social media today, we have a Twitter hashtag of uh, hashtag IRDR11. And please feel free to log in and out um, during the day, especially through the, the tea and the, the lunch breaks uh, and the, the, because the event will actually be live all day um, and there will be a live stream to YouTube. So during those breaks, you may have a few, uh, you may hear us just doing a bit of setting up for the next session. So um, please, we hope that you will enjoy the networking events as well as an opportunity to chat with one another. So without further delay, I hand over to Professor Peter Sammons, Director of the Institute of risk and disaster reduction to welcome you here today at the 11th annual conference. Well, thank you very much, uh, Karina, and welcome everybody to the UCL IRDR 11th annual conference on why warnings matter. I hope you can join us for, th for the full day. So as Karina said, I'm Peter Sammons. I'm director of the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Um, I have also been the lead on setting up the UCL Humanitarian Institute and then the lead on setting up the BSC Global Humanitarian Studies Program. I hope you're all safe and well and as we come out of lockdown again. Some of you I know have been struggling with heavy online workloads as students, health issues, caring commitments, and poor internet connections. So thank you for joining us today. What, what promises to be a day of interesting and thought-provoking discussions. The theme of this, the 11th IRDR annual conference is why warnings matter. It's interesting, I mean, yesterday, 
I was conducting an expert interview for a research project on multi-hazard hurricane epidemic risk assessment for Dominica in the Caribbean with the executive director of their chamber of commerce. For her, it was a given that warnings matter. But in the pandemic, we have seen, to quote our keynote speaker, Mami Matsutori, that past warnings of pandemics were often ignored despite the mounting evidence. So we're delighted at this conference to be hosting the launch of the UCL Warning Research Centre led by Dr. Karina Fernley of the UCL Department of Science and Technology Studies. The annual conference will debate and discuss how we can do better at warnings, both prior and during crises, for all types of hazards. The conference will explore the role, design, uses and evaluation of warnings for different hazards from different stakeholder perspectives in order to examine how effective people-centered warning systems can be developed and help to be prepared for both the expected and the unexpected. But let me just briefly introduce the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Our annual report is out now. We're sorry you're in a position not to pick it up, pick up hard copies, but it will be uploaded to the IRDR website today and the link will be sent out to all participants in this conference. The UCL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction was launched in 2010 with a mission from the Provost to lead transdisciplinary research, teaching and knowledge exchange in risk and disaster reduction in the UK and internationally. This year, our research and impact projects have pivoted to address COVID-19 both in the UK and around the world. The IRDR is undergoing a rapid phase of expansion supported by our MAPS faculty as we became UCL's newest academic department in 2020 and we prepare for the start in September of our BSc Global Humanitarian Studies programme. We have over 80 confirmed students accepted on this program, far ahead of our expectations. There's been a 60% surge in numbers of our master's uh, pro, numbers of our master's programs in risk, disaster resilience, and risk and disaster science. So we have such relevant modules as emergency planning, uh, epidemics and big data, and business continuity, as well as also covering natural hazards and the impact of the climate crisis. The IRDR has been recruiting strongly. We're delighted that Mohamed Shamsudra is joining us as an Associate Professor in Humanitarian Science, Dr. Rosanna Himaz as Associate Professor in Humanitarian Economics, Dr. Yuri Yoffe as a lecturer in Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and Dr. Lisa Guppy as a lecturer in Humanitarian Crisis Response. We also have approval for further appointments in Humanitarian Policy and Intersectionality and in crisis and catastrophe modelling. Promoting risk and disaster reduction to students, colleagues, policymakers, practitioners, and the general public is a core part of the work we do. That is why we set up the annual conference 11 years ago. Invitations for the conference have not only gone out to our IRDR current masters and PhD students, but also to MSE offer holders. You're most welcome. Ideas are advanced through debate and argument, so don't hold back. Challenge the speakers and the panellists, or if you don't understand a point, just ask. Half the participants are probably thinking the same thing. This is your conference too. Finally, I'd like to thank those who have worked so hard to stage the annual conference, and in particular, Dr. Karina Fernley, the conference organiser, and Sarah Geel, the IIRDR communications and events manager, and the rest of the IRDR team. I'd now like to hand over to Karina Fernley, who will introduce the conference and the UCL Warning Research Centre. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. It is lovely, a lovely introduction, and it's a lovely to see you all here today. Um, so thank you very much. We've got an exciting, as I said, exciting day today. So let me share my screen on um, our, a bit of a word on warnings and why they're important. So hopefully everyone can see um, this slide on why warnings are important. And really what I wanted to do in this talk was to really highlight where we're at with warnings and uh, why they're so important to 
me <laughs> and why I uh, went on to try and formulate this this center which I'll be talking about at the end but thinking about why warnings are really important why they do matter why they're such an integral part of our our DRR toolkit so um what are warnings let's start off with what they actually are and we talk warnings are very much part of our everyday life whether it's uh, something like a lighthouse which is obviously providing a warning to ships who are getting too close to the coastlines whether it's the warnings the lights that we see on our cars uh, the fire drills that we quite often ignore or wait until other people are getting up and moving around to, to actually respond to and then we have warnings also in 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 our stories like fables um, and warnings also in oral traditions that extend back tens of thousands of years around um, natural hazards and the threats that they pose to our society so uh, warnings really are um, something that's said um, or written to tell people of a possible danger um, problem or an unpleasant thing that will happen yeah, it's interesting because warnings are often not acted on, believed on, believed or uh, generate the, the desired responses that we want. Um, and warnings are often not considered for many of the vulnerabilities, hazards and threats that we that we face. And, and these are increasing as we sort of move into our anthropocenic um, um, era. Now we have a huge range of, of hazards and threats, um, and these range from natural hazards through to, to human-made hazards, um, to a sort of combination of, of both things, of us creating uh, climate change and global warming, um, which is accelerating what we're seeing in terms of pandemics and so on. And these range in, in a range of, uh, of time zones. So we can have a warning that can take from a few seconds to a minute's warning um, that can provide us that time. So earthquakes, you can get maybe 50 seconds. Some would say that's not a lot, but it's, it's an awful lot of time if we can automate our response to that warning. And those warnings can then increase up from hours and days with volcanoes, tsunamis, flooding, right through to longer term forecasting that we might need to use for deforestation, desertification, extreme rainfall and, and so on. And with our industrial and technological and warfare threats, um, these can also be very, very short um, time in terms of being able to provide any warning, if, if, if any at all. So warnings come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And, and when I talk about warnings, quite often at conferences or presentations, or I, or I, or I say to, the, uh, to someone I'm talking to about what are warnings, people often visualize a siren and think that a warning is that, that actual uh, communication of the, 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 the noise that we hear that something's happening. Um, and, 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 and as such, warnings have become quite focused in, in terms of the realm of looking at the technology behind warnings. But warnings Warnings come in lots of different shapes and sizes and are far more complicated than a single uh, siren giving out a warning. Warnings are for single hazards, they can be for multiple hazards, we can see cascading events, and they are used to trigger communication, events, procedures, protocols, all of which must be put in place prior to the event or it is just too late. These are increasingly uh, being organised due to the nature of it. In, you know, the warning ultimately being for the vulnerable person, um, they're being increasingly done uh, and developed by local stakeholders. So we're seeing a, a huge um, success of community based early warning systems that will help um, the vulnerables to, to manage uh, a crisis as it emerges. Over the years, we have looked at warning systems in lots of different ways. There's been lots of different models, from linear models that are quite top down from, from government down to, to the vulnerable person, through to creating two-way dialogues, uh, through to multi-way dialogues, as we can see here by uh, models by uh, Maletti and John Twig and uh, Reid Bashir as well, right through to the bottom right-hand corner, which some of you, I'm sure if you've looked at warnings, will be familiar with, with is the UN's people-centered model approach. So lots of different models and ideas around uh, how a warning system should look. But how do we define what a warning system? Well, the latest definition by the UNDRR has been updated recently in the last few years, and I think actually tries in a very good way to embody the complexity, but also the main key components of what a warning system is. So it's an integrated system of hazard monitoring, forecasting and prediction, disaster risk assessment, communication and preparedness, activity systems and processes, that's quite a lot in itself, that enables the individuals, communities, businesses, governments and others to take that timely action to reduce disaster risks in advance of a hazardous event. And so 
actually, whilst they sound quite simple, they're hugely complicated, but they bring together lots of different experts, they require thresholds and tipping points, and often use different uh, communication tools or iconographies. Typically, we see um, warnings provided in alert level systems, and uh, alert level systems can take shape in different colours and different numbers, uh, different icons that we can see. Um, and this is a really shorthand way to try and um, have a scientific organisation or government organisation communicate that warning uh, to the public. So why do warnings matter? We've looked at what warnings are, why do they matter? Well, if we don't have any warnings, this is the end result. Um, warnings are such a critical part of the DRL toolkit, and yet they are often ignored. And this was the case here with the uh, Sumatra Andaman uh, earthquake and tsunami that happened on Boxing Day 2004. Um, Following the 9.3 magnitude earthquake, over 227,000 people lost their lives over 11 countries. And many people, many of those people died several hours, up to two or three hours after the initial event. And this was because there was no warning system in place. This is one of those very sad and many stories where there were calls for warning systems to be put into place, but they weren't. And indeed, John Filson from the USGS makes this valuable quote here that natural hazards are inevitable, natural disasters are not. So we know we need to have warnings, but what happens when no one acts on warnings? In this case, we've got a, uh, a, 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 a case study here where warnings were issued, but actually there was not much of a response. So Nevada de Ruiz um, is a, a volcano in Colombia. I'm sure many of you are aware of this story that it erupted in 1985 and scientists detected what was going on and told the local uh, communities in the city of Armero that a, a, a lahar, a mud flow, would be most likely if the volcano erupted and it would engulf the city. And the local authorities insisted that the scientists were being alarmist and that actually um, they did not pass the news on to their local community who were having festivities at the time um, and then a storm which then later hampered communication. Over 25,000 people died needlessly by not sharing the, 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 the warnings that were, that were being provided. And it really highlighted the need for better education, understanding and awareness, um, and also the limitations in the role of science. More and better science is not necessarily going to result in less disasters. And here we have a famous quote by Barry Voigt that it was caused purely and simply by cumulative human error, by misjudgment, indecision and bureaucratic short-sightedness. Now here's the biggie, what do we do when we are trying to warn a global community? Because that's what we're actually uh, facing um, today. Um, you know, we've seen uh, in, in our ever interconnected global community um, that, you know, things, pandemics, viruses travel pretty quickly. Um, and um, We've seen the rapid spread of COVID-19 and the significant impact that that's obviously brought to, to many. Again, here we saw the event coming. Mami Mizutori, head of the UNDRR, speaking a bit later, said past warnings of a pandemic were often ignored despite mounting evidence. Yet for many nations, it took them by surprise. And Dennis Maletti, um, who is a, an absolute legend and pioneer in the disaster risk reduction world, uh, published significantly on warnings. Um, was was quite um, was quite shocked at the response in the USA, and he uh, quoted of saying early 2020 that this might be the largest public information mess I've ever witnessed. It just breaks my heart. We know how to do emergency planning better than anyone on earth, and it's just not there. It is utterly tragic that Dennis Maletti was one of the 601 eight. The 601,824 victims of the virus in the USA today. It is a heartbreaking loss to the DRR community and also to the Warning Research Centre, as he was an early affiliate and supporter of the centre. And we aim to honour his work as part of our, our centre. So what is going wrong? We know that warnings are on the agenda. We've seen fantastic reports like the World Disaster Report by the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. It's been a, a, a specific um, action point within the Hyogo framework in 2005 to 2015 to improve risk information and early warning. And also part of the Sendai framework, a key target to access, uh, give get better access to multi-hazard early warning systems. It's on the agenda. 
but it's not being implemented. Interestingly enough, if we look at recent key health documents that were published prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see in these four documents, the word warning is only mentioned twice. Incidentally, other associated words were not mentioned, so it wasn't like there were a different word was being used. It just shows that there was an, um, a, 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 an interest in the word warning, or that it's not part of the preparedness um, protocols. Why is this? Why are warnings still uh, not being spotlighted in the DRR world? Well, there's four main reasons. And the first thing is that actually warnings are pretty complicated. They're actually quite complex. They're dealing with complex phenomenon in a, a complex world. Um, and they, you know, we have to operate on different spatialities from local levels to national to international to global levels, depending on the type of hazard. They occur over different timescales from rapid onset to slow onset from frequent to infrequent. They can have different functions, whether it's for safety, property or environment. They have to deal with the individual nuances of different hazards and threats. You know, a terrorism alert level is very, very different or warning is very different to a weather warning, uh, very different to a volcanic warning or industrial warning. They also vary in processes. Some warning systems are completely automated. Some are hand oper human operated, some are hand operated as well. Some are standardized uh, and some uh, are, are varying and changing all the time. And as I said before, they can ch change from single to multiple to cascading event. In order for a warning to work, you need to have an indicator, something that we can actually monitor of that hazard or threat, like seismicity, if we're looking at an earthquake. We need to then monitor that. That requires the science, the technology and the investment to do it. Issue that warning, which means making decisions about what the data means and interpreting that. Communicating that warning. Obviously, we do use a siren or text messages or Twitter or whatever um, to do that. For people then to receive that warning, to have that communication, to understand that warning, to believe the warning, which means having credibility in the organisation issuing that warning and then acting on that warning. So for people to be able to see the relevance of that warning to them. Context is massively important. The social, cultural, economic and political context is vital. And one of the amazing things that we can see from the COVID-19 crisis is actually the way that we've got this single event happening that's cutting across all our different nations and how different countries are responding. And that is showing some really interesting insights. For example, we can see just the huge change that it's made in the USA um, from a change of, of leadership and government in terms of the approach um, and the management of the COVID-19 crisis and indeed we've seen people uh, like Jacinda Ardern who've uh, been world applauded uh, for her efforts in the um, management of the crisis and this is in part because she created with her team uh, with a country that's very used to managing uh, disaster risks um, a, a very effective clear uh, transparent uh, alert level system that meant that the public could see a pathway um, to recovery and also uh, know exactly what each alert level uh, enabled in terms of the different actions they could take. The UK perhaps has been a little bit more troubled. The COVID alert level system took three months to come out after the initial lockdown and um, has not really been used effectively. And, and later in October last year, uh, a tiered system that was able to be implemented on a local level was able to address some of the, the challenges of the initial COVID alert level that was facing critique about not really knowing what rules and actions are tied to the different alert levels or tiers, um, and also the challenges of working across four different nations that did different adaptations of the alert level. So it was not standardized, which created some confusion. So thirdly, if we look at the warning literature and studies on warnings uh, across the world, uh, we can actually see that um, many of these studies focus on case studies or case study events or particular hazards or types of hazards. Um, there's actually very little work that sort of cuts across all of these things to look at broader issues common um, to those different um, uh, disciplines or um, hazards or, um, or, or contexts, which is really important for us to learn from. 
And finally, maybe we are adopting a formulaic approach. We, we often see that UN model, which is in this diagram that Carolina Garcia and I produced, where uh, we have those four boxes that we focus on. And, 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 and Carolina and I did a study that looked at early warning systems across the world and actually discovered it's those things in the middle. It's the social linking processes around multi-hazards, um, good governance, uh, increased preparedness, uh, defining accountability and responsibility and so on that are so important to making warnings work. So we have a lot of key questions around, you know, why are warnings not successful? Is it because they're too complex? Is it because we need to consider the local context? Are we studying them in silos, whatever that silo is? And are we formulating them? Are we focusing too much on the science and technology and not on the vulnerability in people? Are we focused on the last mile of the warning and not the first mile? Early warning systems can and should be considered as part of a social process. This is, this is the answer. So overall, the main challenge is that we need to focus on early warning systems as a social process, overcoming the entrenched view of early warning systems being mainly technical with those outside a community handing expert information to those in the community. And so Ilan Kelman and um, Mickey Glantz, both speaking today, um, will uh, have, have provided these excellent quotes um, talking about how we need to have more adaptable um, uh, feedback loops within our, our warning systems. And this means, in essence, if, if warning systems are more social, we need to build a longer term resilience and we need to work uh, better on local and global scales. And this means integrating all aspects of technology, uh, UN sustainability development goals um, and, and working with those in, in the community as well um, to embed it into our everyday practices. So what's the UCL Warning Research Centre going to do? Well, at the current, there is actually no warning research centre apart from ours that currently exists that is focused on warnings exclusively. And we want to bring together that expertise from different stakeholders across a huge range of disciplines, geographies, social and livelihood contexts. We want to cut across those silos of different hazards, threats and vulnerabilities to share knowledge in a way that's not been done before and build on the excellent existing literature and practices to explore where we can create a cutting edge of warnings. In effect, what we want to do is perhaps enable a reframing of warnings to think of them differently that may help it, them to be more effective and connected and used by people. At the moment, we are globally unique as a centre. We have 25 core members from across the UCL and 20 affiliates from all over the globe. We aim to create a global centre of excellence around warnings, provide a community for those warning researchers and practitioners to share ideas that doesn't currently uh, exist to provide research expertise, teaching expertise, policy advice, and public engagement in relation to warnings and help place warnings on the agenda. And we already have a, an associated warning group with the Volcano Alert Level work, Working Group that's looking specifically around warnings for volcanoes. These are some of the key areas that we wish to address at the Warning Centre. We want to create and pursue a warning agenda. We want to enhance preparedness within DRR with integrated warning systems. We want to learn from different uh, warnings used in different hazards, understand local and standardised systems so that we can make sure that they are useful at government level, but also remain relevant to those that are vulnerable and effective, uh, effectively eff affected the most by a, a crisis. Uh, we also want to investigate good practices and see if we can develop any good practices or trends, uh, investigate a range of communication tools about how we can communicate better um, to many different stakeholders at the same time, increasingly in a global way. And finally, integrate credibility, relevance and legitimacy as part of the science policy interface so we can make better decisions in the way that warnings are set up, managed and implemented. So far, since we were set up in September 2021, we've been pretty busy. We've been giving some evidence to the House of Lords under the Inquiry of Risk Assessment and Risk Planning Committee. We've organised a two and a half day training course for the Doctors with Africa Kuam NGO that provides medical health care all across Africa. And we look forward to working with them further later on this year. We've presented at a number of different events. We've received a grant from, from UCL with Dr. Tom Pegram at the UCL Global Governance Institute. And we've got lots of collaborations with centres, the IRDR and other centres and, and groups within uh, the IRDR and across UCL. And we currently have three studentships in, in place. 
the year ahead, we've got today's event. We've also got another launch event next week from the Science and Technology Studies Department that looks at what warnings mean. And there we'll be exploring historical and social cultural meanings of warning, visual representations of warnings and putting warnings into practice by looking at policy. We aim to bring our affiliates and centre members together to give webinars and world leading warning experts. We are building resources around warnings that will be available on our website for you guys to use. We'll continue our policy work, continue our training courses and hopefully build teaching capacity within UCL and provide a space for research and publications. So this is our website, this is our social media, please do keep in touch with us um, and we welcome your input, ideas and collaborations going forward. The centre is here for you to help us move forward and find better pathway forwards to warnings because warnings do matter. And finally, I'd like to say a really big thank you um, to all the team, to my uh, Deputy Director Ilan Kelman, the team across Science and Technology Studies and the IRDR who helped um, set up the centre and also um, today and also to our wonderful uh, interns as well who have um, helped make today possible. So I will stop sharing this slide and to say thank you very much for um, listening to me give a little bit of a word on why warnings are important. So hopefully you've, you've got a bit of a gist of why that's important. And now I would very much like to pass over um, to Dr Joanna Ford Walker, who will be taking uh, our first panel session today on exceptional versus expected events. So please enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Hello and welcome to panel session one, warning systems, exceptional versus expected events. As Karina has mentioned, it's generally recognized and accepted that warning systems are a process, they're a system, they're a cycle. And any part of the chain that breaks will result in the warning system not working. She used the example of the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami and earthquake, which highlighted the need for more warning systems around the world. And since then, global warning systems have been um, put in place for a variety of hazards, such as volcanoes, tsunami, landslides, hurricanes, earthquakes, pandemics, and even terrorism, and more. But we need to make sure we are learning from what has occurred and identifying where issues may be in these chains. So we may have warning systems in place, but we really need to understand why they are not working. And in the words of Capucius, Learning without thinking is useless, but thinking without learning is dangerous. And I think that's particularly relevant to the case of warning systems where we need to learn from what we've done. In this panel, we're gonna consider the context of where we have perhaps regular events or expected events, but we also have events which may be exceptional. You can always argue that most events are exceptional in one format or another, but let us consider the cases where perhaps the impact is larger than expected, where there are late changes, where there's a combination of events or any other exception, which means it wasn't entirely expected to happen exactly how we thought. So perhaps even many, many events could be considered in this way. What we want to consider in this context is how to ensure that early warning systems are indeed effective at allowing those in danger to actually make informed decisions regarding safety seeking behavior and crucially what can get in the way of that. So we may consider issues such as forecast hesitancy and Mickey Glantz will be discussing that along with looking at lead times and who the warning systems are actually for and remembering these are people and we need to consider how different people may behave in response to different types of warning. We need to understand particular case studies. As Karina mentioned, there is lots of literature out there but in this context of exceptional events, what did people actually do and how could we do the warnings better to make sure that safety seeking behavior is adopted as, as appropriate? And we also need to have a method for actually quantifying the effectiveness of warning systems and understanding the uncertainties around them. And particularly in the case of exceptional events, understanding these values and these numbers so that people themselves can understand the uncertainties and respond in a helpful way. And so we can evaluate warning systems as well. And Daniel Straub will be discussing that. In this panel, we will have our three speakers. We will then open up to a panel discussion and then we will allow questions from the audience. So if you do have questions for any of our speakers, please do put it in the Q&A 
um, and I will try and select your questions and pose them to the panel members. At this point, I'd like to hand over to my first panel member, Mickey Glantz, who's from the University of Colorado and director of the Consortium for Capacity Building. He has recent papers looking in particular at forecast hesitancy and local response to disasters and looking at the lessons we have learned. And I'm delighted to invite him to start his talk. Welcome, Mickey. Hello, everyone. I guess you can see me and hear me. There. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the excellent um, presentation already. Um, I've got a page full of notes. Uh, it's really interesting to see uh, how how you're reaching out on, uh, I think, one of the most crucial topics around, and that is why people, warnings matter, but not everyone listens to warnings and not everyone considers a warning a warning. Um, and that's one thing I'll get into. What's happened is um, I've come up with this notion of forecast hesitancy. It's not brilliant science. It's just noting after listening to a radio station talk in January about now that we have a vaccine, uh, there are actual people who don't want to take a chance with the vaccine, even though it was proved efficacious at the 90% level or so. And uh, there are anti-vaxxers, but putting those people aside, uh, probably not doing things for certain re political reasons. Uh, there are other people who really hesitate and have a reason in their mind, at least, to hesitate. And, and they have questions that are reasonable about a vaccine. But I got the idea that uh, it's not, um, does hesitancy also show up in hydromet hazards? And of course, the answer is yes. We've all done case studies or uh, done projects that um, show that people uh, hesitate to take an action when they had the warning. And um, so th that's what I wanted to get into. It's not rocket science. It's just was the, the issue of hesitancy was very interesting. Now, we look back, I'm not in the health industry or business or research, but I noticed that uh, the uh, WHO put together a group uh, a, an expert group on vaccine hesitancy to define it and uh, to discuss remedies for hesitancy and ways forward, which they did in the early part of the last decade. So by 2014, we have an official formal decade, uh, formal definition of hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy. And um, it's vaccine hesitancy refers to delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite availability of vaccination services. And um, I just wondered whether this might be a value, their research might be a value to the people in the hydrometeorological hazards uh, um, uh, ecosystem. And uh, the answer to me was yes. And <clears throat> uh, I'm not, I don't have the time to go into detail. We just did a paper, it's been out maybe a month, uh, three weeks, I, I'm not sure. But there are reasons for this hesitancy and it's called complacency, convenience and confidence. And complacency were, was about, uh, refers to those who do not perceive a need for a vaccine, do not value the vaccine uh, and other things. Convenience, those who have access uh, issues, I can't get to the place I'm working, et cetera. Uh, confidence, those who have a low level of trust, which was a major uh, problem for vaccine hesitancy, a major trust in the vaccine, the providers, the government, the agencies providing it, et cetera. And uh, a few years later, um, Bitch uh, and uh, et al. added a couple of more Cs, now it's five Cs, calculation, uh, individuals' engagement and extensive information research, which most people are not doing. Most people are aware of a hazard in the area, not all of the hazards, but they don't do research about them or look up whatever might be their risks. The other added C for why there's hesitancy is collective responsibility. And there are people who are willing to protect others and there are people who 
uh, focus on their own uh, their own uh, needs, uh, and that has uh, an impact on hesitancy, as we see with trying to read herd immunity. There are people who say, "Oh, I don't need the vaccine. I don't trust it. I don't. I'm a young whatever," and uh, they don't they don't participate. Um, a working definition, and there is none. I made one uh, a working definition up. Uh, and it's up for grabs and modification, and that is the varying degrees of reluctance by different individuals, groups, communities, and nations to respond to or rely on hydromet forecasts, hydrometeorology, in order to take advantage of forecast afforded lead time to prepare effectively for the threats that are known to accompany different hydromet hazards. This is in the paper, but I wanted to mention it uh, for the, you know, it's not something everyone knows. I have an eye on the clock. I don't know how many minutes and they're going to tell me to stop soon. But anyway, um, I, I see, um, and I've actually referred to early warning systems as a chain and, and every stage monitoring, collecting information, putting the forecast together, analyzing it, emitting the forecast, sharing it, uh, with society, the emergency managers, for example, as a target group, and then the emergency managers group have their chain that they continue. But what I got to worry about doing this study on forecast hesitancy was lead time. That links two different communities, two different worlds, two different vocabularies, two different mindsets. And I believe that lead time needs um, uh, more attention. The idea of the researchers is to create more lead time, as much as possible, as much as the data can support. And the emergency managers want to get a hold of that forecast, get the warning as early as possible, even pre-warning development of a warning uh, would be useful. So. Uh, my feeling, I came to this uh, at the end of this study, that there perhaps should be something, not necessarily another structure, but there has to be a guardian of the complete chain. Otherwise, you have two chains, early warning chain, and they pass it off, and uh, it goes to the, the, the uh, responders. Now, the WMO has come up with this impact-based decision support system, which is supposedly linking these two worlds. And I think there's a lot to look at at this IDSS uh, WMO plan. Uh, I think it's got good points. In theory, it's a good idea. In practice, I'm not sure whether it's going to prove to be cosmetic or uh, really um, eventfully and successfully used, whether we're building a better forecasting silo and handing that off treating as a junior partner, the emergency managers, kind of like a rider and a horse. Uh, yes, they're partners, but they uh, are not equal partners. So I think uh, there is this chain issue that, that we have to think about, okay? Uh, merging the chains. Um, one of the problems is that um, the, the response to a forecast the, that leads to vaccine hesitancy or forecast hesitancy is emotional. And emotional is not necessarily always a rational uh, uh, decision-making process. It's uh, emotional and psychological factors take over and things get weighted differently than uh, you might weight them in normal time. So um, uh, the, the fact that I hear a warning an early warning, and then another early warning two, and an early warning three, and an early warning four, where is the break? When, yes, risk is increasing, but whether it's a volcano where you have yellow ribbons tied around trees for, for decades, uh, that warning washes out. Whether you have an orange level and it goes two years, it washes out. It's, it's uh, do we have the colors? Do we have the numbers? What is it that will be the catalyst and so we have in society the risk takers, and those are the people who uh, wait uh, often for the first signs or the tenth sign that the risk is real. Risk averse people generally are more sensitive to warnings and will respond more quickly. 
So um, what the symbol, if I would use one about this, um, the risk takers would be the family trying to load people into a car as the forest fire is raging towards their um, above on the hills above their house when that fire has been moving towards them for five days or three days. And then all of a sudden they're looking for the kids and the animals and a few possessions to, to, to leave. Or a flood where people store things in their basements if they have them or the first floor instead of on higher levels because basements are for storing things. So um, I'm, I'm kind of gotten off the talk, but it's, I'm interested in forecast hesitancy and perhaps there needs to be, and it's a, an onerous task, is coming up with a portal where lessons that are identified are collected. We tend to confuse lessons we read in reports as lessons learned. No, they are lessons identified. And until they're actually used or attempted to be used and tested, they are just ideas and they're often forgotten. And one of the psychological things that I find with disasters is we discount the previous disaster. We're smarter than they were, so we think. We will do better, so we think. And we don't necessarily do that. What happens is when you're not learning lessons, you're backing into the future and you're guided by the past, not uh, by the next event that might come along. The other quick thing I wanna say, because I know they're gonna pull the plug in a moment, and that is that in the UN DRR glossary, there is the word preparedness. It's in the presentation this morning. Preparedness is real. It's, uh, to me, strategic thinking. But what's missing is readiness. And readiness, and I, yes, uh, maybe I'm pushing my own thing, but I do believe that in the UNDR definition of preparedness, there's one sentence putting rel readiness as a subset. I see readiness as more tactical and uh, preparedness as more strategic. And there's a tendency for poor communities to focus on the readiness because they don't have the resources to focus on long-term preparedness. Even though they know El Nino is coming and it brings drought, that's not something they have time or funds or people personnel to deal with now. I don't know if I'm supposed to pull my own plug. <laughs> momentarily, momentarily. Momentarily. Okay, so, so the, the three things I wanted to mention, and these are up for grab. These are, uh, I've been doing early warnings for a long time, um, more than I, I wish to admit. And um, my feeling is that forecast hesitancy is a, is a good concept, it's new. I haven't formulated it, uh, I just came across it and got the idea. I think it's, it should be a further study. I think lead time is sort of an oversight. And the third thing is because we have these people who are risk averse, I think we should be focusing on what I call a late warning system, which is different than an early warning system. It may be a subset, I don't care, it uses different vocabulary, different mindset in dealing with potential victims. It's the last shot, the 11th hour set of warnings, because otherwise it's warning watch. I can never get those in the right order. And I'm old and been doing this for a long time. Which comes first? I don't know. And uh, so I think we have to think about late warning system, some way to stimulate that, that group, that the holdouts, that think they're smarter than the, than the forecasters, et cetera. The other thing I should just mention, I can keep doing this, please stop me when you're ready. But uh, what I would say is, is that we can't let science off the hook. Science has its problems. I did a study back in 82 in Yakima where they made a forecast for water for a valley and uh, their forecast, um, they prompt um, a division of water among users. And what happened was when they saw that there was more water in the rivers than they had projected, rather than fixing the forecast, they waited for nature to catch up with the forecast, which it never did. And then the farmers took the people to court and then the government said, you can't sue a government agency. So anyway, I'm just saying, don't overlook the, the science community. They, 
are put on a pedestal, but I think the emergency managers and uh, informal responses should be on that pedestal with them. They've got to be treated equally. Okay. Anyway, I, I thank you. Thank you so much, Mickey. Um, really interesting ideas there. And say so bringing all these issues together is, is critical. I would now like to invite Rebecca Yor, who's a PhD candidate at UCL IRDR and has a lot of experience working for NGOs in the development and humanitarian fields. Um, Rebecca's recent papers include looking at warning systems and evacuation, and also looking at the suitability of different evacuation centers. Uh, Rebecca, thank you. Thanks, Joanna, and uh, thank you, Karina, for the brilliant introduction. And uh, I must say it's a real pleasure and honor to be a student at UCL um, and be able to present at this inaugural event. Um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to echo a lot of what has been said already, um, mainly by Karina and Joanna and bring in um, what Mickey has just really interestingly said as well, some points there, and say that um, we know very well that the warning um, hazard warnings are not just events, but they're systems and processes and complex ones at that. They include foreground and background factors um, foreground factors being the core components of warning systems that we're familiar with. So uh, the scientific, the communications, the social and infrastructural elements, um, including everything around accurate prediction of uh, data, timely information dissemination, um, identifying particularly vulnerable populations, uh, robust communications networks and adequate evacuation centers and, and emergency shelters for people to go to if they need to. Um, so these all affect warnings directly and critically they all need to work and they all need to work together. And a failure in one element of the system is a failure of the, of the entire system. And that then compromises um, the warning system's ability to protect people and, and save lives. The background factors that we identify, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about these, um, work in all the same domains. So they also work in the scientific, in the communications, in the social and in the infrastructure, but they're not the core components. And while they're not core components, they all work, um, they all bear very heavily on how people respond to warnings and therefore carry as much weight. So they build, these background uh, factors build up over time and they're affected by things like culture, understanding, relationships, people's previous experience, and they inform and they influence decisions. Putting these into a, um, a bit of context then, we looked at three case studies, all islands where the residents are used to hazards and the hazards that we studied were more extreme than the ones normally experienced. So Japan in 2011, a tsunami as well as an, a major earthquake. Philippines in 2013, a storm surge as well as a super typhoon. And Dominica in 2017, a late and rapid intensification of a major hurricane. In these situations, we found that no one warning system reached everyone. In fact, in most, it didn't even reach half of the people that we spoke to. So this raises the, um, this raises the concern that we need multiple types of warning and therefore we need to build in redundancy in systems as well. We found that there was a mixture of instructions. There was incomplete information and detail on specific risks, and there was mixed evacuation advice. We found that vulnerabilities were present that perhaps don't fit with the prevailing norms. So in some circumstances, um, it was the men that were actually more exposed and faced more danger. But many people in these situations chose to stay at home when this was not the safest decision. Warnings need to combine what happens in the time period around a hazard and they need to combine considerations of what's happening um, in the beforehand, in the buildup, and what's happening in people's lives, um, you know, before and after these events that affect the way that people live and people respond. 
so that people can make fully informed decisions and the most appropriate safety seeking behaviour can be prompted. So we can see throughout these case studies how the intersection of foreground and background factors um, occur and how important they can be. So in Japan, we had a failure in communications when mobile phone messaging was incompatible, had a software incompatibility. And a lot of the newer, more modern smartphones that the younger people used were actually not receiving these messages in this, in this instant. And usually the older technology was more effective at reaching people. In Dominica, we found that mixed messaging left holes and a lot of room for interpretations. So for example, does Dominica lie in the Windward Islands or the Leeward Islands? To add to this confusion, Hurricane Irma, which was the first Category 5 hurricane of this Atlantic hurricane season, had passed through um, very, very um, closely before, so within only two weeks before. Extensive warnings were heard for this hurricane and a lot of preparations were made as a result. And then, so when Maria came through and didn't have the effects that it was, uh, sorry, when Irma came through and didn't have those effects, people then saw the warnings for Maria as um, in a similar sort of line. So um, many thought it was a false alarm and didn't think that it would affect them in the same way that Irma largely didn't. But actually we found that a late change in track and intensity in Maria then actually um, meant that the island was hit head on and with deadly force. Relating back then to the breakdown in these foreground factors in the communication element of that situation, um, we see that the background factors really then came into play and people fell back on expectation. Um, they, they developed their own risk perception based on these information gaps and they fell on previous experience. They did what they always had done. Um, there's often, a mis there's often an assumption that a failure to respond to a warning in the expected way means that the public don't fully understand their risk. In our examples, this was only true because the risk information picture was incomplete. And like Mickey just mentioned, you can't let science off the hook, you know. Um, so people ended up reverting to what they usually do, which is usually safe enough. In the Philippines, the, the term storm surge was widely used in the warnings, but it was also widely misunderstood by those people receiving the warnings. And so people expected the strong winds, but they didn't necessarily expect the strong, uh, the wave of water that accompanied those. In Dominica, the radio was the most common form of warning communication, but networks collapsed when Maria was still a managed, manageable sized hurricane for most people. And it's late intensification to a category five hurricane just before landfall um, happened when those radio networks had largely broken down. With these information gaps that existed because of these infrastructural failures, people fell back on what they knew usually works. And so they stayed at home. A lot of people stayed at home and they battened down the hatches and rode it out. But this wasn't an informed, a fully informed decision because what they thought they were facing um, was actually very different to what they did face. We also, in line with this, have to accept that the realities of where people live and the quality of their everyday lives um, takes priority. So in Japan, for example, the tsunami warning sirens weren't always heard because of the topography of certain populations surrounding certain settlements. And also elements like the soundproofing of homes um, among residents that lived close to Sendai Airport. So this blocked out the aircraft noise, but it didn't, but it also meant that a lot of the siren noise was being, being blocked and not everybody heard them. We found these realities in daily life um, came in many forms. So factors such as age, family, gender roles, social dynamics and societal expectations, and even strength and security of houses um, really heavily influenced people's decisions to either stay at home or to evacuate elsewhere. In the Philippines on hearing a warning, it was, it was uh, relatively common to divide families. And like I mentioned before, this this did in some instances put men at, uh, in more danger because it was the men invariably that stayed behind to protect the home and to continue working where this was possible. 
So the foreground factors tend to guide the design and implementation of warnings at high levels. And it's these really that the technical experts and the governments pay attention to. But then as the information disperses out and down through regions, cities and villages, that often means that the individual um, ends up at the peripheries in this perspective, but to the individual at risk and they're um, thinking about their own situations and, and their surroundings, they're very much um, at the centre of the equation. In their perspective, in this perspective, the background factors then come to the fore and ultimately guide the decision making process. In disaster risk reduction, we often think we alone are able to objectively and scientifically assess risk, while maybe non-specialists or often people living and affected by disasters can be subjective or even irrational. But this is a harmful deficit-based notion, and it really undermines the experiences and priorities of those living with disasters. It washes over, for example, issues such as poverty, inequality and lack of choice or power. In the Philippines, we found, for example, leaving livestock, leaving pets, leaving fishing boats and home businesses behind um, were actually to be either lost or destroyed was actually as much a risk or perhaps even in some circumstances, even more of a risk than the impending hazard that people faced. Um, an evacuation centre that was itself exposed, unsafe, difficult to reach or overcrowded could often make staying at home a much more attractive option, irrespective of the other risks that were fa being faced. And these are all background factors that will ultimately determine if warning systems are effective at saving lives. We know that life is complicated and in considering how people make critical de decisions in times of higher risk and higher stress, we have to see the bigger picture and understand how these warnings fit into the lives of those hearing them, how people lived before the warning was issue, issued, how they're likely to live once it's passed, which means that we ultimately have to continue making warnings a part of everyday life and we have to integrate them as much as possible. And while it goes without saying, of course, warning infrastructure must be robust, it must always be developing and always um, and always advancing. Um, we must also address the consequences of mixed messaging and unfamiliarity with scientific terms, the consequences of uncertainty in forecasting and forecasting and how people interpret that and how people respond to that individual and group risk perception that's always changing and that's dynamic, particularly when unfamiliar and unusual events occur, and particularly when the information picture is incomplete. So looking at these extreme hazards in this way really highlights more clearly, I believe, um, the issues with fore foreground and background factors. Um, where points of failure arose and that meant that the system didn't work as a whole. When foreground components of a warning are not connected properly to each other or when background um, considerations are not taken um, in locations and according to the populations we're working with, the warning systems will continue to leave people unprotected. Now, I'm just going to show you uh, a lot of foreground and background speak here, but this is what I'm referring to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I'll leave you to have a look at those uh, factors for a moment. And then I'd like to invite Daniel Straub, Professor for Engineering, Risk and Reliability Analysis at the Technical University of Munich. Um, his recent work has focused on optimal decision making under uncertainty by combining stochastic modeling and data driven methods um, with some focus on rare event estimation and building bridges between disciplines. Thank you very much, Daniel. Welcome and thanks a lot for, for having me here. It's a real pleasure and uh, I've already learned a lot again. So I will just give a brief 10 minutes introduction into quantification of the effectiveness of warning systems. And um, yeah, I have a slight background on these gravitational hazards. So I'm going to present an example also that is with this focus. But a lot of the things I'm saying is applicable to, to uh, all kinds of hazards. 
So warning systems can, as we have seen and we have talked about, can be a very effective tool for, for risk management. So here is a yeah, half, a, half a mountain <laughs> that comes down and installing sensors here, there was a very effective warning and people were evacuated in the industrial area below one day before the event. And you know, it's kind of yeah, no brainer it, 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 and it works and it's effective. So we might wonder why do we actually need to, to quantify the effectiveness? So, you know, if it works, it's effective. Maybe we know that which factors make it effective, but why do we need to actually quantify it? And I could find mainly three reasons. One is that and there is a fourth hidden reason. One is that it can help us, and I'm showing an example here later, to optimize the design of the system and the configuration of the system. Um, both of technical and non-technical aspects. But in many cases, we also need to compare them against other measures. And the last point is kind of related to that, namely that we often have to demonstrate that money spent for warning systems is actually well invested. So if you want to get, in some countries at least, if you want to get money from the government to install a warning system, you have to show its benefit cost efficiency. And also, you know, we have there, there are other ways of reducing risk. So we, we need to be able to, to demonstrate that warning is indeed effective. Now, let's jump directly to this quantification. And uh, there are a few equations, but it's not going to be too hard, I, I hope. So we want to quantify the effectiveness, and the warning system ultimately reduces risk. So we need a measure for risk and what we do here is we use a very basic measure of expected loss. Um, so you can kind of conceptually calculate it with this equation here, hazard, exposure, probability, vulnerability, and consequence, and you sum over all possible scenarios. And the warning system mainly reduces the, the exposure probability. So we evacuate. We, 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 we can remove also assets from the endangered zone. In some cases, but most of the technical aspects, we can also reduce the vulnerability of a system. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the points where, we, where the warning system actually changes the risk. And this is reflected if we now quantify that. Um, so I'm going back in the same equation as above, but now a bit less, less obvious, but we still have these four components. We have the presence uh, probability, we have the, the occurrence probability, the vulnerability, and the damage potential. And we calculate that for each possible scenario and for every ex potentially exposed object or person. And the total risk is then just a summation over all these possible scenarios and over all the possible subjects and objects. Um, so nothing fancy here. Now, to define the measure of effectiveness, uh, we do a kind of a relative measure where we said, okay, by how much is the risk reduced by a, a warning system? So we take this ratio of the risk with the warning system divided by the risk without the warning system, and then subtract that from one. So if the warning system doesn't change the risk at all, then the effectiveness is zero. If the warning system completely reduces the risk to zero, we get an effectiveness of one. Makes sense. Now we insert what we have just seen before. So we take this kind of ugly looking expression here on the top and on the bottom. And on the top, we now have a change in the exposure probability. So in this case, we're focusing on the case where the warning system reduces the exposure. So because your people are, are warned, um, there may be organized evacuations, and people will, or less people will be in the endangered area. So we reduce the, the probability of somebody being present. That's the change. And now, if we additionally assume that we, or we consider only one relevant scenario, and we assume that there's no distinction between the different um, 
persons that are potentially affected. So they're all equally likely to, to, be, to be affected. So in that case, this equation reduces to this simple equation that says the effectiveness of the warning system is just one minus the ratio of the presence probability with and without the warning system. Right. Now we're almost done with, the, with our equations. So what is now the, 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 the probability of being present of a, of a, of a, of a we talk about persons here. So uh, the probability of a person being present at the, the location of the hazard, at the time of the hazard, um, that's the same as the original probability, but now reduced by a factor that depends on the probability of detection. So the, the warning actually gives a warning and the probability of what we call of compliance. Mm -hmm. So here the idea is that people can, can choose to comply with the warning or not. And um, which is something we had just talked about in the previous uh, presentations as well, no? so hesitancy and so on. So this probability of compliance, we'll look into that later, but if we insert this expression into our previous expression, we see that the effectiveness in this case is just a product of probability of actually identifying the event and the probability that persons comply with the, the warning. So now let's look at this compliance and I'm going to just look at one aspect that affects the compliance. Mikey was talking about other aspects, and um, but one important part of, of of warning is that, and this was mentioned also in the previous talk. Uh, if you have people think if this false alarm, they will not comply. So, and the more false alarms that actually occurred in the past, the more likely it is that people will believe that that's not just another false alarm. So these black points here are based on some empirical study, although not related to, to natural hazard, to be honest. Um, but it's an empirical study of how many, how people actually complied with, with, with warnings or alarms in function of how many alarms there were, pre, false alarms there, there previously were. And clearly more false alarms means less compliance. We call this the cry wolf effect. I guess you are aware of the fairy tale. So now we take that back in our equation and we now see that the probability of compliance becomes in this case a, a function of how many false alarms we give. And that allows us to solve kind of a, an important problem, namely that we have every warning system has a certain probability of giving correct warnings and a certain probability of giving a false alarm. And I can make, I can change my threshold when I give a warning and I will increase both false alarms and correct warnings. So I, I describe my system by the so-called ROC curve. And because my effectiveness is a function of these two things, and it's shown here in this color scheme, I can now find for a given system, what would be my optimal point, my optimal system design, choosing between the right amount of, of, of not too many false alarms, but at the same time, of course, pro properly identifying the right, the actual events. Okay, just a short two minutes and then I'm already done. Already, we applied this here for the pre-flow warning system that is installed in Switzerland. You have sensors on the mountain top that try to yeah, pick up signals from the, the, the debris flow. And because there is a certain distance here, there is a bit of time, 10, 15 minutes, for a warning to, 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 to occur here below after you pick up the signal here. So there, this is installed, and this is just a red light and some audible signal as we saw before the, the, the siren. Um, and the question is, yeah, again, what is the optimal configuration? We actually modeled this whole thing with the so-called Bayesian network. I'm not going into detail here, but we, this, this tries to pick up all kinds of things that can go wrong um, in the process of the warning. And, but this is not including the response. So this is just the technical app and, and yeah, more or less technical aspect of the warning, organizational technical aspect of the warning. 
And then we get different configurations that give us different false alarm rates and false different um, detection rates. And again, under the underneath here, so this is the black line, I should say. So the black line shows the different possible configurations. And then we see the effect, the, the, the effectiveness in function of these two parameters, where actually the false alarm rate is more important than the, the, the detection rate. And we find the optimal configuration of the system. Okay. That was very brief, just running you through an, a simple, relatively simple example um, to show that these things can be done. Clearly, there are challenges, and maybe we discuss on some of those. Um, but it can be an effective decision support. Um, in this case, for example, to find the right balance between this detection rate and false alarm rate. Um, and we have done this, we've applied this to, to, to different uh, applications, in some of which experts say you cannot put probability on things. You, know? you cannot quantify things. But my last point here, and this is what I want you to leave, what I want you to keep in memory is that, yes, it can be challenging and sometimes seemingly almost impossible to quantify effectiveness. But the, even if you just try and the formalization that is necessary for this quantification does help, if you do it properly, does help and foster the understanding of the warning system. So that was it from my side. I'm looking forward to some discussion and um, yeah, I'm giving back to Joanne. Thank you very much, Daniel. And it's really interesting to bring together the issues on the social side and actually trying to quantify them um, and actually adopt this multidisciplinary approach. Um, I'd now like to invite um, the panelists to sort of discuss amongst themselves any issues raised. And I'm gonna raise a few uh, questions that have come up from the Q and A um, where I've got groups of people asking, I think similar questions or, or questions around similar themes. One of these is how do we deal with both false alarms, but also misinformation, particularly in the context of social media or, or governments giving misinformation. Um, and related to that was also, do you consider drills as false alarms or how do you include the idea of drills when looking at false alarms? Um, and then another uh, group of questions came around, what about people who perhaps don't see these events regular, who are less familiar? So groups like tourists, for example, and how can we include those within um, the warning systems? So if I just pose those questions to, to all the panel members, if anyone would like to comment on any of those comments, or if you have questions for each other, please, please do go ahead. Please just speak freely. Could I please ask Mickey Glantz to turn on his video? Thank you. Hello. Um, well, there are, I've been answering some of the questions uh, offline, but um, let's say her, the false alarms. Um, not not uh, in, in 2004, one year before Hurricane uh, Katrina, 250 people got together in, in Louisiana from the governments and civil society. Everybody was there, the forecasters, et cetera. And they had a scenario called Hurricane Pam. There was no Hurricane Pam. And at the end of two weeks, they came out with a press conference and said, don't worry, society, we've got it covered. We know where we're going to put the tents, the hospitals, where we're going to get rid of the debris, et cetera. A year later, 13 months exactly, uh, Hurricane Katrina came. Almost nothing, nothing they did in the Hurricane Pam fire drill was used. So uh, I just wanted to say that if, if you want to look up Hurricane Pam, it's fascinating. Okay, so that's to share that. Uh, I have some comments on other things, but go ahead. Maybe there are others on that. Yeah, maybe I'm I should just, I just want to quickly address the, the, said the second question. I guess the, the first question is maybe more related to, or should go answered by social scientists, but but because I showed this specific example and we, we, we used this kind of very simplified assumption of how people react to false alarms. And in that area, there are many tourists, indeed, uh, this mountain, so a beautiful area. And um, indeed, the, the, what we assumed that the, the false alarm rate affects 
the kind of compliance with the warning does actually not hold for the tourists who have never seen, or most likely, most of them will not never have seen a false warning before. So it, it, it would actually, in this case, even be beneficial, you know, if, if you have multiple false warnings that could reduce your compliance, it could actually be somehow be beneficial to have, yeah, if people have not seen that before. Huh? So locals get used to this kind of, as you said, also expected events and, and yeah, nothing much happens. And so I can still cross the river because, you know, even it, it is red light, but I know that for five minutes, nothing will come. And so you, 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 yeah, you kind of ignore, start ignoring. Whereas tourists who are new, they see a red light, typically they follow no? because they, they, it's a new environment. You don't know where you are. You're more careful. So just as an answer to the second part. I would, I would just um, a, a mention on the, um, related to the false alarms, the, the comment on drills. I think actually um, using drills, whether, I, I don't think it would be, I mean, it, perhaps some people would see it as a false alarm, but I actually think the use of drills is really helpful because one of the issues that comes up in the social sciences, at least the prevailing issues continuously is the fact that um, we all recognize that um, warnings need to be built into our everyday lives. We need to practice them as a way of living rather than just facing them when a hazard approaches. But that's easier said than done, and it doesn't often happen in practice. And I think the use of drills is one of the key mechanisms for actually doing that and accustomizing people to those processes. One of the examples we saw in the Philippines was a self-organized group, for example, and the, um, they had designated roles for each other. The leader of the group had a high-vis jacket with his own um, role printed on the back, and the community actually um, brought it upon themselves to regularly drill within themselves for a range of hazards, not just for um, ty typhoons that we were looking at as the Philippines is a multi-hazard environment, but this small example of, um, of a community sort of arranging their own hierarchy and structure so that there isn't chaos that ensues among the population or there's slightly less chaos um, and people are accustomed to managing their roles because they do it in calm sort of peacetime, if you will. When something does happen, it's almost like the decision making is, is is taking a little bit out of it, and um, what has been drilled and and what has become practice then takes over, and people are able to respond really quite calmly and really quite um, uh, cohesively. So I think actually drills is a really good drills are a really good mechanism for embedding some key practices that help to familiarise through everyday life with um, with some life saving roles. Following on from that, um, Rebecca, there's a question, and I know there's been some chat about this as well, um, about the role between, you know, disastrous reduction development, but specifically what happens when warnings can lead to, you know, tens of thousands or, or many, many deaths, um, but what can be done to protect assets and livelihoods as well as people? Perhaps that's the next step. Um, does anyone like to comment on that as well as trying to save human lives? What can we do to protect assets and livelihoods in the context of warnings? I saw just very very briefly. Sorry, I saw um I saw that comment in in the comment box actually, and and um, did write a quick response to it. I think it's a very valid comment, and um, I think it it is something that requires more research. But just one thing that's coming out of my research and and our research actually, <laughs> Joanna and Joanna and I. Um, are looking at mechanisms, preparation mechanisms, such as um, microinsurance, for example. So it may be that um, a, a mechanism that allows people to put things, um, uh, put certain structures in place before a hazard actually occurs can help to protect some of those assets and livelihoods, whether it means um, the ability to be able to pack things up and, and leave a location with them, just uh, some an ability to be able to move or an ability to be able to um, put certain protective measures in place that would perhaps maybe not save everything, but but save something or save enough. Um, it's that it, I think it really lies in those preparatory methods. And I think, um, you know, from our examples, microinsurance could provide a, an interesting avenue to explore for that. 
Uh, hello, I have a different uh, comment um, on, uh, on something Rebecca mentioned. Well, it's mentioned at the beginning, actually, the extraordinary, outstanding, catastrophic event. But, you know, uh, put it in the context of one's life or one's working life or one, you know, we're talking decades. So you, you're a forecaster for 30 years and then after that you retire and you're a gardener, you know, whatever. But um, rare events, for most people, a lot of events that happen, even something like a one in a hundred year flood or one in 50 years is, is a one and done event in their minds. The perception is, oh, Boulder had a flood in 2013. The last time they had flood was 1895 or 1906 or something like that. We're off the hook. We don't understand probabilities. We don't understand nature. Many people don't really understand the risks in the area, let alone tourists who have the opportunity before they go somewhere to look at the risks. <laughs> the, you know, you, the outliers, you know, you can't deal with. But um, there's this perceptions become reality. I mean, even if our perceptions are wrong, the actions we take based on them have real consequences. So we tend to look at disasters as, in many cases, one and done, you know, but uh, that's not, the, not reality. And then you say, well, we must teach more STEM, you know, science, technology, et cetera, et cetera. But it's more than just better science teaching. I was an engineer and I, you'd be happy I'm not an engineer, okay? You need all these things. Um, okay, I'd like to come to each panelist in turn as we're coming towards the end of the session. I'll come to, uh, I'll go in the reverse order. So I'll come to Daniel, then Rebecca and Mickey. And I just wonder if you could answer in one sentence, what change do you think needs to occur to help with warning for exceptional events in an environment that does have expected events? What, what one change or one sentence, what change would you like to see occur? Um, so I'll go to Daniel, then Rebecca and then Mickey. Yeah, I think I, I think a lot of the, the things were addressed, in particular by by Rebecca, and uh, so there, there is, of course, yeah, a lot of we have to do a, a lot of learning about how to to prepare the people, how to raise the understanding of the difference, or, or the, yeah, and and not so that things are not seen as false alarms um, or false alarm, not really completely false in the sense of binary false, but falls in the sense that we think it's less crucial, it's a less critical event than it actually turns out to be. But uh, I, my wish would, and I guess that's already happening, is coming back to, to my point of, of, of understanding things through quantification is also to, to make the use of all these data that we can now collect quite easily, in particular in the social sciences, uh, to 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 have a better understanding and also to have models of, of which factors actually make a difference and, and and to do things also in the social scientists to do this research really quantitatively that would be my wish thank you and over to rebecca um i think uh looking very very broadly and and uh, ideologically i think obviously um, addressing structural inequality and addressing why people are disadvantaged and why other people aren't. But on a practical level, I think, um, aside from the drills and aside from integrating warnings and response to warnings into our everyday lives, into the fabric of how we live, um, I think preparation, let's just put our money where our, continue putting our money where our mouths are and preparing in advance for more difficult situations. Um, the livelihoods and assets is a perfect example of that. If that's a problem, um, then what do we need to do beforehand to be able to address it? So preparation is key. Thank you, Rebecca, and over to Mickey. Okay. Um, early warning systems are very complex. My life is very complex. A peasant's life is very complex. So, I would say that, and I'm not, and this isn't from great wisdom, but just my gut feeling is that we have to put more emphasis on readiness than preparedness. 
give it some more birth because people can get ready more easily than they can get prepared because they don't have the resources. So uh, warnings are very important to them. And uh, so I feel we have to push readiness as tactical responses to warnings and threats, as well as long-term preparedness, which seems to fall to governments and larger organizations. But what can I do? Okay. And that's that feeling for the community. It's not just myself. Okay. Readiness is for me. Preparedness is for the community to deal with. Anyway, random thought. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, all the questions raised and particularly to the, my panelists, to Mickey, Daniel and Rebecca. Um, I think what's been really interesting in this session is really looking at from different discipline perspectives, um, like with so many problems in disaster risk reduction, we need to understand this and we need all the different disciplines to come together and tackle the problem and recognize that the problem of warnings for exceptional events um, in the case of sort of standard events isn't just the problem of the warning systems, it's, it's part of a bigger picture as well. So thank you again, um, and I hand back